Welcome to the Andrew Colette Show. I'm going to attempt a hardcore Nuzlocke using only Ice-type Pokemon. Ice-types are notorious for being the worst typing in Pokemon existence. Sure, they can hit some things hard, but they also don't hit some things hard. Worst of all, the only thing they resist is their own ice typing. And to top it off, they are weak to some of the most oppressive types out there. I got some great news though. Look at all of our encounters. Since I'll be playing Sword, Ice-Q is cut for being a Shield exclusive, then I can only have Glalie or Frostlass per the species claws and can only pick one of the fossils from Route 6. Here are the hardcore Nuzlocke rules. When a Pokemon faints, it's dead. And when they die, I have to take an ice bath for one minute per dead Pokemon. I can only catch the first ice type encounter from each route or area. No dens allowed per the amount of encounters. No items in battle, but held items are okay. Set to battle mode. No Dynamaxing. No leveling past the next gym leader's ace Pokemon until the start of that battle. Since my subscribers voted for ice, we get to play Pokemon Sword. Finally, not she. Shield. Base fighting types and Gordy's rock types are definitely more of a challenge than their shield counterparts. Sobble was picked as our starter, that way Hop gets their advantage with Score Bunny. As with most of these rare types, our first ice encounter is available in the wild area, specifically West Lake Axwell. I hunt for the female snow runt first because there's no way I want a Glalie on my team. It just kind of sucks compared to Frostlass. Since it's my first encounter, I can just restart the game until I find a female. After a few tries, we find the female, which frozen fear while being caught. A couple things here. The name theme is types of ice cream or flavors, and we're gonna put in an ice pun counter because there's gonna be a lot of them. Snow Rut is named Dairy Queen, and I immediately go to the more dangerous parts of the wild area to find the Dawnstone evolving Dairy Queen into a Frostlass. Now, I haven't fished much in the past, but there's snow time like the present to start now. At East Lake Axwell, shelter is reeled in and named bubblegum. On to another stone hunt, I find a water stone behind Motostoke and evolve bubblegum into a cloister. Another ice type Pokemon is recruited onto the team at North Lake Milo being Snover and is named Mint Chip. Mint Chocolate Chip just couldn't fit unfortunately. And our last stop in the wild area for now is at Dappled Grove where Vanillite joins the team being named McFlurry. Team Yell is no match for our bubblegum as they ice school spear their way into victory. Hop loves to use physical attackers and is always bugging me to look at their gnarly super effective attack dude well dude look at my cloisters insane defense stat you look at it Hi. Speed is a joke with Dairy Queen on our side, just one hit KOing each one of his Pokemon with a single Shadow Ball each. One of the most frustrating parts of the game is on Route 4. The Eevee only has a 1% chance to appear. It took us about 24 minutes just to find one, and it even put up a fight to stay free, but eventually we got it. The Gen 1 starter is named Cookies and Cream, but the real final boss of the game is already here. The Digging Duo. Yeah, they just keep failing and failing and failing until about 30 minutes later, they finally uncover an ice stone from the earth. So annoying every playthrough. At least we get the awesome Glaceon evolution from all that shenanigans. But step aside for our Dairy Queen to take on Milo. The Queen wisely orders a substitute in its place, which is not broken from the Gossip Flower's magical leaf. Having disturbed the Queen, the Gossip Flower is executed by a single Ice Fang. The Dynamax Eldegoss hopes to get revenge for its plant friend, but the Queen Ice Fang first, then stalls each Dynamax turn with Substitute, Protect, and Leftovers until the Elder Goss is back to normal size. Dairy Queen Ice Fangs again, giving the Elder Goss a brain freeze, flinching them, returning no attack. One last Ice Fang wins us the game, along with our first Gym Badge. As we travel through Route 5, Cookies and Cream handles Team Yell with multiple Ice Beams. Then Bubblegum decides to Flex Shell Smash in front of Hop's face. We'll be using this move a lot, so let me explain how it works. Shell Smash decreases our defense and special defense by one stage, but in return, our our attack, special attack, and speed are doubled, resulting in Bubblegum drowning all of Hop's Mons with Surf. For the fight against Nessa, I decided to try out a unique strategy, Toxic Spikes. After setting up two layers, all incoming Pokemon will become badly poisoned. Goldeen is surprisingly the main obstacle just because of its special attacks, which Bubblegum does not like. So he takes care of Goldeen with a couple poison jabs. How can Cloyster even jab? Aracuda is poisoned upon arrival, and Bubblegum protects to stall, heal with leftovers, and prepares for Dreadnought by using Iron Defense. With our tank ready, Poison Jab finishes Aracuda. Now that Dynamax Dreadnought is here, let me explain a flaw about my plan. Dynamax has some dumb perks that don't make any sense. For example, the poison damage done to a Dynamax Pokemon only subtracts a percentage of HP from the base HP stat, not the doubled Dynamax HP. I hope that makes sense. Essentially 
Essentially, they don't take as much damage from residual damage if they're Dynamaxed. Bad game design in my opinion. Anyways, our tanky Bubblegum is successful stalling the Dynamax, even gets to Poison Jab Dreadnought in the face afterwards, but had to switch out to Mint Chip just to be safe. Dreadnought then passes out from the injected toxins, awarding us with the second gym badge. In the second Galar Mine, there's nothing to explain with Bead, just know that Dairy Queen gave him the cold shoulder. Now here's the unbelievable footage. I know you're all gonna think I hacked my Switch or something. Thievul is the only scary opponent since Bubblegum Spadef is low. But look at this, two videos in a row, Hop actually helps and hits the right target. Thievul, allowing Bubblegum to finish them off the next turn. Please don't report this to the Pokemon company what's been going on with Hop in my game. I wanna keep it. Kabu is next and is our first big obstacle being the Fire Gym Leader. Here's the bigger problem. Bubblegum has a hindering Spadef nature, which makes the night Tails a threat. Not much I can do about it, so let's head on in. To help protect Bubblegum, Dairy Queen leads the charge by setting up a light screen and is then burned. Bubblegum switches in and is entrapped within a fire spin and will receive residual damage each turn. He's also will o wisped but then begins to shell smash. Now it'd be nice to have a citrus berry, but Bubblegum needed to hold the expert belt to sweep after two shell smashes. Unfortunately, we've made ourselves look too weak and Bubble is already at 1 HP. Well, at least we're gonna knock out nine tails. Ah, dang it. I forgot Ninetales at Quick Attack. Back to square one with Ninetales. Dairy Queen tries her best, but Ninetales wins the duel. Cookies and Cream manages to beat Ninetales, but Arcanine is way too much to handle and blazes through the rest of my team. Honestly, I got cold feet. I really didn't want to EV train, and I was too risky with Bubblegum's bad special defense. All right, here's the Cloyster for attempt number two. The most important thing about its stats is the special defense. It's not bad. Well, for a Cloyster. I did the Calcs, and this one should be able to survive the first two turns if they choose to Will-O-Wisp. Let's head into the Kabu rematch. And lucky for us, Ninetales does indeed Will-O-Wisp. Bubblegum shell smashes, and since we're faster now, we shell smash first the second turn. This leaves us at minus two Spadef again against their fire spin. Thankfully, after the secondary fire spin damage, Bubblegum is alive with 19 HP. Now, please get rid of that Ninetales. Just surf them all. That was a lot simpler of a strategy than the first attempt. It just goes to show how Pokemon's nature and IVs can really affect a Nuzlocke. GG's, Kabu. I hope we don't have to cross paths again. With the level cap raised, it's time to expand our team. I find a Cub Chew at Bridgefield and give it the very apropos name of Klondike. At the Stony Wilderness, Sneasel is captured and named Oreo. Then I have to waste my time at Watchtower Ruins just to get this thing. Oh no, it died. I will be so sad. Not? Don't worry. According to the Species Clause, it's only in effect for other areas if the Pokemon has already been caught. So I wasted my Watchtower Ruins encounter, head to Giant Sea, and spend way too much effort trying to catch this Delibird and name him Dippin' Dots. I hope you like the box, buddy. It's best if you get comfortable. Now for some Pokemon I actually do care about. Swindub is found at Giant's Mirror and named Cookie Dough. Last capture in the wild area for now is Mime Jr. at the Rolling Fields and is named after my wife's favorite ice cream flavor, Cotton Candy. In order to use Cotton Candy, I level him up until he learns Mimic, which allows him to evolve into a Galarian Mr. Mime. It's Cookie Dough's turn to level up, evolving into a Pillow Swine. By the way, look at that horrible nature on Pillow Swine. Minus speed and plus special attack, literally the worst. But that's not all. We have the Move Relearner to teach it ancient power, then level it up once more to evolve it into the awesome Mamoswine. Gotta count my blessings here when I get the Arc Dazolt on Route 6. Usually I have to deal with the Digging Duo, but Pokemon Sword gives you both the fossils needed for the frozen electric fossil thingy. Thus, Arc Dazolt is added and named Banana Split. I know that was a lot of catching Pokemon, but the ice types are not spread out through the game that well. But now it's time for a series of battles, starting with Hop. Unfortunately for our rival, his Cramoran can't do much to stop Bubblegum from shell smashing, then putting up an iron defense to make up for the defense boost. Cramoran hardly scratches Bubblegum's shell after a second shell smash. Bubblegum hangs 10 and surfs Hop's whole team once again. Fourth gym badge time. This is the first time I've fought Bay since my original Nestlock video. And since Dairy Queen is still alive, this battle is not hard at all. Why? Well, Hitmontop only has fighting and normal type attacks, meaning it can't touch our queen. She begins to nerf Hitmontop with a Will-O-Wisp, cutting it in half the damage done from her physical attacks. Then the queen charms them three times, bringing their attack stat down two stages each time. There could be an exploit to my plan being critical hits, but Bubblegum has no worries about that, thanks to his shell armor ability, meaning he can't be struck by critical hits. To ensure safety against Bay's other fighting types, Bubblegum starts the iron defense spam. Every attack by him on top is nullified by leftovers healing each turn. Once we're at plus six defense, Bubblegum begins to shell smash three times, maximizing his power. Since that brought down 
down the defense three stages. We iron defense again twice, and now we're ready to sweep with surfs. Bay and her hit on top, Pingoro, and Surfetched are gonna need ice packs after this beating. But there's one we can't one hit KO. The big one. Gigantamax Merchamp doesn't have a chance since they can't critically hit through our iron defense, but it does take two surfs to take this one out. That's the fourth gym badge. Oh look, another bead battle. No commentary, just an excuse to see our amazing Dairy Queen being awesome. At Balanlia Town, after defeating this breeder, we obtained the Eviolite item, which boosts the defense and special defense of a non-fully evolved Pokemon. In our case, Cotton Candy. Now I do like Mr. Rhyme's design, but that Mon is just awful. Sure, it gets more special attack, but it loses speed. I'd rather have a faster Pokemon with better bulk that can make up its power with nasty plot false surrender okay <gasps> oh my gosh dang what a close one if it was mr rhyme or we didn't have the evil light item we would have had a death in our hands and mr rhyme would have been slower than gardevoir i think i've proven my point after that close one klondike evolves into a bear tick and the cotton candy action doesn't end there oh yeah he's our lead for opal wheezing special defense is trash so psychic okos it mawile is next which does have iron head cotton candy thunderbolts then opal throws by using iron Iron defense rather than her iron head attack. Mawile goes down to another Thunderbolt. It's Togekiss's turn to face the clown, which gets Thunderbolted right away. They try to retaliate with an ancient power, but it's just not enough and gets Thunderbolted to zero HP. Opal's ace, Gigantamax Alchemy, tries its best to harm Cotton Candy through a protect, then a substitute, and then a substitute behind a protect, and it still does not break. The cream Pokemon's original form is overwhelmed by two psychics, winning us the sixth gym badge. I'm telling ya, Galarian Mr. Mime is the truth. Hop is back and wants another try against my cloister but my strategy with bubblegum is ice cold we simply shell smash and they confuse ray us which gets negated by the lumberry i had bubblegum hold ice beam is now enough to shatter hops tree boltund is next but doesn't know how to swim and cinderace's flames are extinguished but snorlax doesn't die to one hit oh never mind we take those and heat more just exists and i whatever and now it doesn't route 8 brings us our next encounter which will either be a snom or darumaka i like both but the monkey's better it's only only a 5% chance to get Darumaka though. Thus, we find the Snom. It's okay though, because we do have a great team. Snom is named Mochi. We arrive at Sir Chester to face gym leader Gordy. Now I gotta share some strange facts about this place. First of all, Gordy is Melanie's son. I never knew that. And now they don't talk to each other anymore after some heated battle between them. Get over yourself, Gordy. Just call your mom or I will. The biggest issue I have with Gordy is his pose. His neck has gotta be killing him. So I'm gonna make things fair. I position myself the same way. Anyways, Mint Chip leads our team landing the four times super effective seed bomb on Barbara Cole. Instant knockout. Since Minchip's snow warning ability brought the hail upon his entrance, he sets up the Aurora Veil screen. Shuckle does minimum damage with Rock Tomb. Bubblegum comes in and just carries the whole gym on his back shell. Only needs one shell smash to massacre his rock types. Shuckle's stone edges are not enough to save him. Stone Journer only has 20 base special defense, so of course he gets annihilated by a surf. And Colossal is four times weak to water, which is why we only needed one shell smash. GG, Gordy. Give me that gym badge and call your mom. She's as cold as ice. And Hop wants to battle again. Just two more fights with this guy. We're doing exactly the same strategy that we used against Bay. Double can't touch Dairy Queen. So she will wisps Charms. Switches back. And in comes Bubblegum. Shell smash. Then surfs double. Pinkurchin. And Cinderace. Liquidation attack against Snorlax. And a final surf against Corviknight. Now that I have access to Route 9, the water upgrade is now available for my Rotom bike, allowing me to choose between Lapras and Bergmite this route. I no 90% of you want Lapras, but Bergmite is so much more useful against the next two gym leaders. I chose the Ice Chunk Pokemon, naming it Ice Pop. I immediately gave it some sugar candy, evolving her into an Avalug. Like Cloyster, Avalug has a huge defense stat, but unlike Cloyster, Avalug gets body press. If you've seen any of my Nuzlocks, the Marnie and Piers battles go the same way every time, so let's spice it up this time. Ice, ice, baby. Ice, ice, baby. All right, stop. Start the eye on your defense. Time to let the body press commence. Have a look. Try not to land on them lightly. Iceberg, no need to stand their pole lightly. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. Time Marnie's battle up in a bow. To the extreme, the reception was ice cold. Against peers, my two leads push and pull. Dance. Don't miss the will-o'-wisp burned. Killing their attack. Cobra Berry go burr. Deadly. Cutie charms edges crafty. Anything left to reflect makes us bulky. Love it or leave it. Have a look. Make way. Body press now. Stand attack. Don't play. If there was a problem, spam the A button. Button. Let's chill now like they're all landing. Ice, ice, baby, too cold, too cold. Ice, ice, baby, too cold, too cold. 
Ice, ice, baby, too cold, too cold. Easy battles, but I can't use that simple strategy against Raihan's goons. Not much of a headache. Dairy Queen Ice Beam Slagoo and Cotton Candy Freeze Dries Pelipper, which is super effective against water types. Slagoo doesn't survive another Ice Beam. Raihan's second trainer uses fire types, so I equip Cookie Dough with Choice Scarf, making her faster than Ninetales, but locked into Earthquake. Okay, that shouldn't matter. Oh, what the? Wait a second. Oh my gosh. I forgot the shell trap activates right away. Oh my gosh. Dang, I totally forgot about the shell trap. Those were two good Pokemon I just lost. And I was actually planning on using both of them for the Raihan gym leader fight. Well, I gotta buy some ice for my bath. Just a reminder, every Pokemon that dies is a minute in that bath. I bought two bags from Walmart. Dumped them into the bath. Got in. My groin is now frozen. I even wanted to put on a sweater. The ice was melting fast, so we dumped what we had from our freezer into the bath as well. Two Two minutes done. Before the 8th gym battle, I evolved the remaining team members. Oreo holding Razor Claw transforms into Weavile. McFlurry levels up, grows a second scoop becoming Vanillux, and I grow alongside Mochi to increase friendship, evolving him into a Frostmoth. Time for Ryan. Ice popping Cookies and Cream have to start for specific reasons. Cookies is wearing the Choice Scarf, enabling him to outspeed Flygon, shattering them with Ice Beam. Ice Pop begins building its wall with Iron Defense, and the turn ends with Gigalith putting up Stealth Rocks. Sandaconda is next in line. I have to protect Ice Pop in order to avoid an Earth Power, but I was too safe because Cookie's Ice Beam demolished their snake. And even better, Cookie survives the body press. I think we can save the evolution. I'm gonna send Dippin' Dots in their place to face Gigantamax Duraludon. Ouch. Already 50% from the Stealth Rocks. And our Deli Bird dies from a Max Knuckle. I expected that. Better him than Cookie's. Another Iron Defense for Ice Pop makes Gigalith's body press only do 14 damage. It's Mochi's turn in the lineup, who's also pierced badly from the Stealth Rocks, then heals with its berry. Its meal was eaten in vain because even with the protect, Mochi dies from a critical hit. At least Ice Pop returns to Smackdown with Body Press, squashing their Gigalith to 0 HP. Cookies and Cream returns and is instantly reduced to 9 HP per the Stealth Rocks. He Ice Beams into the Giant, taking half their health. Ryan gets Cold Feet, spares Cookie's life by aiming into Ice Pop instead. Oh man, can Ice Pop finish this with Body Press? Yes! Wow, only two died. I thought it was gonna be three, but wow, great job everyone. Well, that's another two minutes added to the ice bath clock. Problems in life are a lot worse when you 100% focus on them. Luckily, my son's bath toys are nearby to distract me. Let's go to Route 10 to catch where I was supposed to back on Route 8, a Darumaka. I name it after the delicious Chunky Monkey ice cream from Ben & Jerry's. Of course, I tap her with an ice stone, evolving her into a Darmanitan. This thing is a beast. Look at its ability Gorilla Tactics. A 50% attack boost, but you're locked into one move. Basically a free choice band. Back on track with the main story, we enter the Champions Cup semifinals. First against Marnie. And you all deserve some Oreo Weavile action. I know it's a fan fave. Lipart and Oreo stare each other down, preparing with Nasty Plot and Swords Dance, respectively. Oreo's not afraid of Dark Attack, so he dances once more, then resists the Snarl. We just have to stay cool. After being insulted by that scout, Ice Punch clocks Lipart part out of there. Oreo's natural speed is impeccable and overwhelms Marnie Scrafty, Toxicroak, and Morpeko with one ice punch, each to the face. Gigantamax Grimmsnarl requires a different kind of punch, since they are bulkier, so Oreo poison jabs instead. That's it for you, Marnie. For the final rival fight, Dairy Queen burns the sheep, then proceeds with the ice, ice, baby. Charming double three times, placing a reflect, and most importantly, keeping the area clean with safeguard. That way, when Ice Pop comes in, there are still three turns left where she can't get paralyzed from the body slam. Two iron defenses, then a pow from body press. One more iron defense in front of Snorlax just to be safe in the long run and maximizing body press damage to every single one of Hop's Pokemon. Even a max knuckle from Cinderace is nothing to fear. You should have gone for the critical hit max flare, buddy. Oli and his goons are next on my hit list. They possess steel types, which means Ice Pop faces all of them. There is one culprit that's not a physical attacker being the Bronzong. Hop, of course, does not aim for the right target and Ice Pop doesn't even do 50% damage to Bronzong. They then both team up on me with Iron Head and Extra Sensory, taking more than half of our health. Don't flake on me, Ice Pop! Later, Hop changes his ways, body slamming Bronzong this time, giving Ice Pop just enough leverage to get the KO this time, then survives another Iron Head. If that Bronzong didn't die last turn, Ice Pop would have been a goner. Thanks again, Hop. 
Now for their boss and Rose's assistant, Oleana. And we're going hard. Oreo doesn't need setup. Just ties the choice band around its head and locks in throat chopping. Frost Slash, Salazzle, and Milotic. Right to the throat. Jeez, Oreo care to explain? He leaves work, he's on his way home. Wham, his kappa is detated from his head. You have just spit on my face. Well, Oreo could have handled Serena as well, but it's better for Ice Pop to tank the kicks while iron defensing three times. The body presses are so powerful that even a Dynamax poison type that resists fighting attacks falls in shambles to just two hits. The tournament resumes, and I shake up the lineup with the most surprising bench demon being Ice Pop. But the six I chose all have a specific purpose. Dairy Queen is doing the typical weaken the opponent's attack stat method again, but not as blissfully. Mawile still causes pain to our royalty with iron heads. After the first charm, I debate removing Dairy from the field, but decide to risk it, hoping for no crit, which thankfully the Iron Head does not. After those two charms, Oreo swaps in, holding its place from the continuous Iron Heads and play roughs. Protecting between turns does help for leftovers recovery. Since Oreo only has not very effective moves for Mawile, three Swords Dances are required, and finally the Deceiver Pokemon is decapitated with a Throat Chop. Bead's latter three Pokemon are all Fairy type and weak to Poison Jab, so just a quick sock to the face to Gardevoir, Rapidash, and Gigantamax Hattering settles the first of the four back-to-back -back matches. Nessa is the second of the four, and I elect Cotton Candy to handle her team. First protect since Gulissapod's bug attack first impression has priority the first turn. Now he's open to be cracked by a freeze dry, and Emergency exits back to his trainer temporarily. Now I was not expecting to see the Sea King next. If it Megahorns Cotton Candy, then our mind will lose to Barraskewda. I switched in Dairy Queen, and I'm embarrassed to say, all the Sea King did was Aqua Ring. Cotton Candy would have been okay, but now we gotta weaken this fish with Will-O-Wisp, Charms, and a Reflect. Sea King smart strikes back at us each turn, but to no avail. Back to Cotton Candy to think up a nasty plot, doubling his special attack. Sea King's Mega Horn finds our soft spot, not only being a super effective attack, but also a critical hit. This makes me nervous for Barraskewda. Freeze Dry, get him out of here. Galissapod is back, and we've seen this before. Protect the first impression, then Freeze Dry back. There's the scary fish. Can Cotton Candy hold? Don't freaking crit me. Don't you freaking dare crit me. Don't you crit me. Hold, Mr. Mime, hold, hold. Oh, thank you. Okay, good job, good job. Now, freeze dry back. Good job not getting exposed there. Pelipper, the first simple enemy from this team. Freeze dry is quad super effective. Sorry, bird. And Dreadnought is four times weak to an energy ball. Ness's creatures were put on ice. Two of four down, time for the third. The Bay rematch. Dairy Queen is at it again, weakening Halucha with her many methods. Halucha's only attack that can hurt our ghost type is Bounce, which actually does land a paralysis on our queen. As we struggle to execute our plan because of full paralyzations, Halucha runs out of bounce people decides to high jump kick us, of course misses because we're a ghost, crashes and knocks itself out. Uh oh, we're walking on thin ice. That wasn't supposed to happen. Nerfing Halucha was supposed to bring Cotton Candy in harmless, but now their Sir Fetch is on the field. And you know, I'm not risking a critical hit brutal swing. Cotton Candy has to be smacked by the brutal swing, losing half of its life points. Luckily, being faster and having Psychic, Sir Fetch and the Phalanx that followed were both mind blown to fainting status. Grapple Locked is our next window of opportunity, only in possession of normal and fighting type moves. Dairy Queen is sent back in to work her burn, charm, and reflect magic. After exhausting that strategy yet again, Cotton Candy returns intact, ready to nasty plot twice. First one, the octopus missed, and the second attempt was not a critical hit, allowing Cotton Candy to show his power, obliterating not only Grapple Locked, but also the terrifying Gigantamax Machamp with a single psychic. Three down with just one left standing. And it's about freaking time for Chunky Monkey to star in the limelight. While holding choice band along with the Gorilla Tactics ability, Monkey is effectively double choice banded, meaning that Torkoal just got crushed by a double powered earthquake. Turnator should be no problem as well. Oh, sheesh. Oh my gosh. Nightmares. Flashbacks. Ah! Ah! Flashbacks. <laughs> okay, we're okay. We're okay. Just. After the Gujar is taken care of, Flygon's levitate ability would nullify our locked in earthquake if Monkey is kept in. So Dairy Queen takes the stage while Flygon summons a sandstorm. We've seen it and we'll do it again. Ice beam the Flygon, my lady. Gigantamax Duraludon is the last obstacle of the pseudo Elite Four trial. Substitutes are placed to withstand the max rockfall, G Max depletion, and max steel spike. I'm actually surprised they didn't steel spike every time for the defense boosts. With the Dynamax expired, it's time for Banana Split the Arctozolt to fulfill its purpose being a sack. 
<laughs> I know a lot of you like this guy, but frankly, there's not a lot going on for it this playthrough. So this plan sack from the beginning was perfect for Mint Ship to come in unscathed. Bonus points for Banana Split Static Ability Paralyzing Duralidon. Mint Ship now outspeeds, going first with Earth Power, and is struck by the critical hit Stone Edge, barely surviving. Raihan uses the item full restore, but Mint Ship gets a high roll with the second Earth Power, which allows him to protect the next turn, so Duralidon is defeated by the Hail, summoned by Mint Ship's Snow Warning Ability. Hail yeah! Remember with Banana Split Dead, is another minute in the ice bath. I scramble to find the correct letters to send a message to anyone out there who can assist. And I'm sure all of you have been wondering, where the heck is Lapras? Well, it's time. With the level cap raised, this level 56 Lapras puts up a fight but is eventually caught and named Milkshake. However, is this the answer for Rose's mono steel team? No, it's gotta be Ice Pop. Can she even do it or will she break? Oh yeah, what am I even worried about? Ice, ice, baby. Ice, ice, baby. Too cold, too cold. All right, here's why I needed a Lapras. Leon, stop using a freaking Pokeball for Eternatus. Anyways, I was saying, all right, here's what I needed Milkshake for. Eternatus. Milkshake is decent special defense, and its half water typing makes a neutral flamethrower and max flares. Attach an assault vest onto her as well, raising her spadef 50% and limited to only attacking moves. As you can see, it was totally worth it, and since this Lapras has higher physical attack, I just spam Avalanche. Eternatus goes down, and this time I catch the nuclear or whatever it has draconic Pokemon in a friend ball. Got a full team packed and ready for Leon and unlike his Charizard, I don't want to lose my cool. Chunky Monkey vs. Asia Slash. They King Shield first turn like usual, but Monkey's Earthquake makes no contact. The second turn, Earthquake along with double choice band power, Oko's Asia Slash. Impressive stuff. You know who else is? Haxorus. Yeah, Iron Tail just wipes out Monkey, sadly. My second choice is also a choice item user, McFlurry, holding the choice scarf. And since its snow warning ability brings the hail, we lock into Blizzard, which we can't miss in the hail, plowing over Haxorus. Rhyperior's rock typing can seem threatening, but its special defense sucks. Bye-bye. Now, even with choice scarf, Dragapult is just way too insanely fast. So they just puff first with Flamethrower, McFlurry lives, then pelts back with another Blizzard, tearing Dragapult down. Rillaboom got nothing to say here. Jeez, Leon has a lot of ice weaknesses. All right, Gigantamax Charizard, this should be quite the challenge for my ice types. But Vanillix took out so much of their team. Three, uh, was it four team members? Did Vanillix take out four? Took out Haxorus, Dragapult, Rhyperior, Rillaboom? Jeez, holy crap. Oh, what the? <laughs> no, it's just... Oh, jeez, that's hilarious. Well, that changes things. I do have to switch, though, because McFlurry is out of Blizzard PP. So Milkshake tags in, and Charizard is still frozen. Honestly, I don't think it's fair to McFlurry if Milkshake takes the glory. So back comes out the ice cream cone. Don't thaw, don't thaw. Don't you dare thaw. Oh, frozen. Yeah, okay, McFlurry gonna do it. Yeah, baby, okay. <laughs> Oh, can McFlurry do it? Oh, McFlurry does it! And McFlurry is the MVP for the Leon fight. Oh, full restore. Oh, shoot. Wait a second. Think if I had Blizzard, we'd probably win. Because that would... Oh. Wait, wait, maybe maybe, maybe if it's a high roll. Wait, McFlurry might go down, but Charizard will go down too because of the hail. Come on, McFlurry! High roll, high roll! Yeah! <laughs> One more compliment for me. Great job, McFlurry. As the grand finale with Leon ends, Cotton Candy's retirement begins and evolves into a Mr. Rhyme, earning the well-deserved rest. Well, there you go. Finally, a monologue with only ice types. Gave me the chance to use some Pokemon I normally don't consider. Also, patting myself on the back for not misclicking so much like the ghost video. For the next type I do, I'll put the five most liked comments in a poll and have you all decide again. Subscribe and like the video if you want to see more of this content. Thanks for bearing with me through all these ice puns. Ice, ice, baby.